Well, that was uh, very, very educational. I didn't really myself fully understand the whole history of uh, trying to manage the development of the glowfish, but I will, I want to correct something you said. <clears throat> you argued that these animals could be stress reducing. If you had been at Glowy's funeral when we <laughs> buried him, you would not make such an assertion. And I invite you to visit his site. It's in <laughs> Philadelphia. Yes, very, it's quite traumatic. Um, we're now entering into a part of the program which I'm particularly uh, keen to hear the presentations because they represent uh, good mentorship by me. The first uh, speaker is, uh, the next speaker, not the first, is Carolyn Plunkett, who's at NYU now at the uh, Langone Medical Center in the Division of Medical Ethics. And we thought it would be useful for you to hear the story of uh, the moths <laughs> in upstate New York because it's a little bit of a success story. So I think uh, you'll find this interesting. Great. Uh, so thank you, of course, for inviting me into art, especially. Um, it's really a great opportunity for me, and I feel really honored and grateful to be here among such an esteemed group of, of industry leaders and scientists and bioethicists. Um, so as you can tell, the title of my presentation is What Went Right? Uh, Lessons from the Approval Processes uh, for the Release of Genetically Edited Moths. And I have to make two clarifications right off the bat. Um, the first is that the moths were not approved for licensing or marketing. They were approved for release in the process of collecting uh, safety and efficacy data in pursuit of that goal. Um, so that's a major uh, clarification right off the bat. Uh, and the second is that I, I do mean the word right here in two senses. Um, the first is practical. In that sense, a lot went right um, to lead to a relatively quick uh, approval uh, for release and uh, with little pushback from the court of public opinion, at least on the surface. Um, but I have in mind, uh, for my purposes, a second meaning, the somewhat more technical, ethical meaning of the word. Um, and in that sense, what did researchers, regulators, and others do that is consistent with the current ethical thinking on genetically modified insects and animals? And perhaps more importantly, what did they do wrong and what can we learn um, from their mistakes? Uh, so here's a little overview. I'll first provide some background uh, on the GE moth, genetically edited moth, uh, why it's been developed, how it works, and the process that led to its approval for limited release uh, in upstate New York in November 2014. And then I'll review uh, just three ethically salient features of the experimental design and approval process and suggest how they might guide our thinking about how to update regulations going forward. Uh, when I mentioned to people that I uh, am researching ethical issues surrounding moths, they usually have this in <laughs> mind. <laughs> uh, Mothra, and who was a little bit before my time, but I've learned is a really giant, scary-looking moth big enough to apparently defeat even Godzilla himself. Uh, so this is, this is uh, unfortunately, I think, what people have in mind when they think of genetically edited moths. But I usually try to push back um, by reminding them that lit this little fellow, the diamondback moth, despite its small size, it doesn't look very small there, but it is, um, already does a lot of real damage to our crops, um, like cabbage and cauliflower seen here. Uh, they, or more precisely, their, their caterpillar progeny feast off of cabbage, broccoli, kale, and other crops, costing farmers around the world approximately four to five billion dollars. Um, and a lot of effort and time and money goes into preventing this damage, um, but of course the question is how can we do that? We've tried. Um, pesticides are still our best weapon against the diamondback moth. Um, it, however, easily adapts to chemical pesticides, making them ineffective. And public opposition to pesticide use presents legal and ethical challenges. Its runoff uh, poses challenges to our water supplies, and pesticides are not cheap. So this has spurred researchers to look to other methods for controlling moths and other insects. Since the 70s and 80s, uh, the sterile insect technique, or SIT, has been used. And that uses radiation to sterilize insects, which are then released to mate with wild populations. Successful mating between the wild and the sterile insects should result in no offspring. This has been moderately successful in area-wide eradication and suppression programs against numerous crop pests, 
um, but wider is hindered by several challenges. First is that radiation renders the sterilized insects less competitive than their wild counterparts. So the wild females continue to mate with wild males rather than sterilized males. Um, and second, uh, it's difficult to conduct large-scale sex sorting of the sterilized insects. Um, and only males are, are released, typically, um, because adult females are sometimes ha hazardous or ineffective. Um, but again, that sex sorting process is, is tricky. So uh, through these limitations, researchers have continued to develop better methods. And we've arrived now at gene editing. And, and as we learned yesterday, and I'm constantly reminded, this isn't a particularly new new thing, um, but we now have better tools to do it. So zinc fingers, talons, and most recently CRISPRs provide increasingly precise and efficient methods to modify the insect genome so that they're no longer so harmful to humans and our food. Um, a pioneer in the field of genetically edited insects is uh, a company now, a spinoff of Oxford University called Oxford, uh, OxyTech, which is now a part of a bigger corporation. Um, but they and their academic partners have been developing and breeding various kinds of genetically edited insects since the early 2000s, um, including, of course, our diamondback moth. And more private and academic enterprises have recently entered the space. Um, I'm sure you haven't missed the recent publications on mosquitoes and gene drives. Um, and there's no doubt that interest in continuing to develop genetically edited insects is on the rise. So while my focus here really is just the diamondback moth in upstate New York, I think the suggestions and lessons do translate well to these other applications. So um, our moth, Oxytex GE moth, is bred with a self-limiting gene. Um, I'm not even going to try to describe the complex interactions that go into uh, producing this phenotype, but I do know that it causes premature death. Um, and this, this, this moth, um, th this gene causes only females to die. Uh, so this makes sorting the females and the males prior to release very easy because the females will die and, and uh, then you have a, a, a male-only population to release into the wild. Um, and as the male moths mate with wild females, their female progeny die and after successive releases, they'll have effectively eradicated a local population of moths. So if successful, the farmers would no longer have to rely on pesticides or SIT to reduce local populations of the diamondback moth. Uh, lab work and indoor cage experiments in both the UK and in New York provided proof of the concept that the self-limiting gene is uh, effective in reducing the population of wild moths, but really to get this thing going, they have to test it outside. Um, so when it was ready to test the safety and efficacy of the GE moths on a larger scale, Oxytech partnered with researchers at Cornell University, hence the New York connection. Um, and that was in part um, because Cornell University uh, has access to the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station, um, which is an 870-acre property in Geneva, New York, dedicated to testing new innovations in agriculture. Um, and in addition to receiving support from Oxytech, a particular lab at Cornell led by Andrew Shelton received public funding for this project. Um, so, it was the researchers at Cornell who ultimately applied for the permit to release uh, the genetically edited moth on the property of the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station. So I'm going to now take a closer look at, at what that approval process looked like. Um, the USDA is, Department of Agriculture, is charged with reviewing permits for the release of insects that are classified as pests. So a plant pest is any living insect, there we go, Insect, mite, nematode, slug, snail, invertebrate animal, bacteria, fungi, or other parasitic plant which can directly or indirectly injure or cause disease or damage in any plant or parts thereof. Uh, the genetically edited moth is, uh, is considered under this regulation because it is a plant pest uh, that is detrimental to crops, plants, and trees. So applications to release the GE moths are reviewed and ultimately approved by the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS, which is a division of the USDA. So APHIS received Cornell University's application for a permit to release the GE moth in October 2013. And again, this is 
Cornell sought permission just for caged releases of the GE moth on the property of that experiment station, and then open releases upon um, if success was established in the caged releases. Consistent with any other application for plant pest release, APHIS conducted a comprehensive environmental assessment of the release um, and concluded ultimately that issuing a permit for the field release would have no cumulative impact on the physical environment, biological environment, or human health, and would have no effect on threatened or endangered species. So essentially no significant finding, no significant impact. Uh, after releasing the EA to the public in August 2014, uh, APHIS invited public comments during an official 30-day period, again consistent with, um, with the regulations. They received 287 comments, ranging from, quote, farmers need new methods of agricultural pests, relatively uh, supportive, to hell no GMO, and all other iterations of that sentiment. Uh, despite this backlash and lots and lots of negative comments among those 287, uh, APHIS approved the caged and open releases of the GE moth in November 2014 uh, with, with very little fanfare. Um, and this was upsetting to many of those who publicly commented. Uh, caged releases have occurred. They occurred in early 2015. And a team of researchers led by Dr. Shelton at Cornell and Luke Alfie of Oxitech published their results in BMC Biology in July. And they they said, quote, we conclude, subject to field confirmation, GE insects offer an effective and versatile control option against the diamondback moth and potentially other pests and may reduce reliance on and protect insect insecticide-based approaches. And owing to their success, the team is planning uh, limited open releases, again, on the site of the Agricultural Experiment Station in 2016. So that's a quick overview of, of what happened. I'm now going to switch gears from the science and approval process to more of, of my forte and comfort zone, which is a focus on, on the three features of the moth case that I think are most salient. Uh, and those are the location and type of release, the perceived burden of the pest among the local population, and their public engagement strategy. And I think Cornell did pretty well on the first two of these, so they get a clapping hand emoji. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but there's a sad face here on public engagement because relying only on the official comment period while consistent with the regulations and perfectly legal did risk undermining public trust in the technology and in the regulatory mechanisms designed to protect individuals. Um, so I think we should do better on that. Um, before I go in to the specifics on these three things, uh, I just want to point out that I'm now going to highlight some differences between the approval process of the GE moth and a case of another bug, uh, the genetically edited Aedes aegypti mosquito. Um, because while the USDA approved the release of the moth within just 13 months of receiving the application, the FDA has been considering uh, the, an application to release the GE mosquito in the, in the Florida Keys for four years. Um, and it has not even yet uh, uh, release the environmental impact assessment of the GE mosquito. So I think that's something to keep in mind. There are important ways in which the bugs and the regulatory processes governing them are very different, but I think the comparison is nonetheless helpful. So on the location and type of release, um, as I mentioned, Cornell's researchers proposed to release the moth um, only within the agricultural experiment station and to perform caged releases and only then limited open release. Um, es thus establishing sort of safety and efficacy in a stepwise pattern. Moreover, should any of the moths escape, it's unlikely that they'd reach the limits of the experiment station because the moth is a notoriously weak flyer and the release, the release sites are surrounded by plenty of land. And this is consistent with, with what's been presented as an ethical approach to testing GE insects. Uh, researchers and ethicists have called for a stepping up of trials from caged releases in a simulated mesocosm to a limited release on designated sites to possibly a release in a um, suboptimal ecosystem for the insect or animal, um, and only then on to open release. And this allows researchers to more cl closely monitor the effects and activity of the GE insects, the spread of the traits, and unintended consequences. And it serves to assure the public that, um, that there is close oversight and, and protection of their safety in mind. <clears throat> 
Contrast Cornell's stepped approach with Oxitec's proposed release of the GE Mosquito in Key Haven. Uh, Oxitec proposed an open release uh, right off the bat of the GE Mosquito on public land in Key Haven on the basis that it had already undergone laboratory and cage tests in, um, and even open tests in other countries with no serious adverse effects. Um, but data from other countries did not allay the fears of residents of Key Haven who were concerned about their unique ecosystem. And it's unclear whether and to what extent the data from other countries uh, will be taken into account in the still unreleased environmental impact assessment. So I think that uniform and transparent requirements for this stepwise testing and licensing of GE insects would communicate clearly to both the public and to researchers and industry partners what is required in which countries and in what kinds of facilities prior to the open release, which is what's really scary to the public. That way, by the time the GE insects advance to open release, it will have established uh, evidence of safety. Just want to flag here one further issue, which is that we still need agreement, even if you adopt this process, on what are the markers of success at each step. Um, so there needs to be some scientific consensus and regulatory guidance as to when it's safe to move on. So what constitutes success in the lab? When is the release of GE insects safe enough for a limited open release? How do we measure the long-term effects of editing moths and other insects on their predators and prey or the water supply? How long is long enough for overall ecosystem surveillance to justify approval for licensing and marketing? We still need more guidance and input as to how to answer those questions. So moving right along, we have here um, the burden of the insect to the local population, um, for which Cornell gets another applause. Um, the diamondback moth is seen as a major burden among farmers in upstate New York, as you can tell from this quotation from a local farmer. It's obvious from what he says that the, the diamondback moth readily adapts to chemical pesticides, requiring alternating applications of multiple chemical uh, compositions. And that raises concern about worker safety, pesticide residue, potential hazards to the environment, and the like. The moth, if safe and effective, would likely be of great utility, not just globally, but to the very farmers in New York State. Um, and that's why Cornell gets my applause. In addition to it being less challenging politically, it's ethically less problematic to test GE insects in a community that is adversely affected by the insect under investigation. Just as with any other clinical trials and kinds of research, risk to participants, and in this case the immediate environment, are outweighed by the expected benefits, and there's a stronger justification for exposing participants to risk when benefits are expected to accrue to the very same population. Once again, contrast this approach with the Florida Keys. Uh, residents of Key Haven, Florida, do not see the Aedes aegypti mosquito as a threat to their local community. Um, while acknowledging the seriousness of diseases like dengue and chikungunya and yellow fever uh, in other countries, they frequently cite the fact that the most recent cases of dengue in the Florida Keys was in 2010, and even then in relatively small numbers. We all know that climate change might affect that, and there's a really big concern, but that hasn't um, been that persuasive uh, of an argument with that community. And whether they're right or not about, about the incidence and, and threat of dengue in their community, there is some ethical support, at least, for the position that um, it's, it's generally more acceptable and appropriate to expose research participants to risk if they're expected to, to benefit um, directly or indirectly from the research. Finally, the public engagement strategy. Um, Cornell C seems to have taken a, a trust the regulators approach. They followed the regulatory process and the law to the letter. APHIS fielded public comments to its EA during the designated 30-day period. APHIS bore the responsibility of responding to public comments, but to what extent they addressed those voices remains up for debate. Various groups on behalf of organic farmers registered complaints with the USDA, Cornell University, and the governor of New York criticizing APHIS for not addressing their concerns and for quietly approving uh, the trial. So we saw these headlines. Uh, GM moths field release near New York causes outrage, which was followed up by experiment station defends moth trials. And in just the last month, um, now that the researchers are looking toward open release, we've seen advocacy groups call for halt to open air field trials at, of genetically edited moths. 
And just in the Washington Post on, I think it was November 20th, this tiny moth stirring, the GMO, stirring up the GMO debate in New York. Uh, so this is certainly uh, important to the public. It's worth noting that Cornell held, held no town hall meetings or public forums to address citizen concerns about the GE moth release, but they do have a very informative website. In stark contrast to Cornell's silence, Oxitec was eager to engage the public in the Florida Keys throughout their process of um, submitting an application to the FDA. Uh, and they've, and I only know this because they've very publicly uh, have said so. Uh, this may be a response to previous allegations that Oxitec had acted covertly when it released their mosquito in other countries, um, especially the Cayman Islands, and perhaps to avoid a repeat of that backlash, um, Oxitec representatives held presentations to local clubs as well as city and county commissioners. They've held town hall meetings with community members various times over the last four years. Um, and they've continued to educate and work with Florida Keys residents over the last four years while opposition to the release of the mosquitoes has grown and the FDA has remained silent. So my concern is that one might wonder um, whether mounting evidence of public opposition to the Florida Keys mosquito release thwarted the regulatory process in place. Whether or not this is actually the case, the unexplained delay in issuing the environmental assessment of the impact of an open release certainly invites the thought, and that's unfortunate. I think regulators should be careful not to stoke fear or concern on the part of researchers or biotech companies that public deliberation and education will be penalized. Neither should regulators give the impression that serious public engagement is not necessary, as may have been the case with the GE Moths trial. So I, I think it's quite clear that more public engagement and education is needed, but of course saying that and doing it are two very different things. Um, I, there's a lot of questions that remain. Should we ask for public deliberation and comments on each proposed release, each species, each purpose, on all of the above. Uh, public deliberation on how to design the public deliberation processes. Um, I'm gonna leave these kinds of questions open for now and something to come back to in Q&A. But I think at bottom, clear communication and education are essential. And it's a responsibility of the scientists and industry partners that propose releases of these insects. Um, to, to, uh, to perform those public deliberate, deliberative and educative processes. And I think there was not a strong enough emphasis of that in the GE Moths case. So in, in closing, I'll just sum up these three features with um, a few suggestions going forward. First, I think, is, is um, a need for uniformity in, the expe in expectations for stepwise releases or expectations for um, how these trials should proceed on US soil. Um, and consensus on what constitutes success when something is safe enough for release. Um, I think that these uniform expectations would uh, cross agencies. I know there's, so the, the, the moth is regulated by the USDA, the mosquito by the FDA, some other agencies get involved. I think there was, if there was sort of clear communication uh, and clear standards across the agencies, that would be uh, really useful. And, Transparency should guide communication on what those standards are to both the public and to science and industry partners. And finally, public engagement must be prioritized throughout the process of breeding, testing, releasing, and marketing GE insects and animals. Um, all three of these suggestions are rooted ultimately in trust, and I really see trust as the ultimate ethical basis for, the regu for creating regulations of GE insects. Um, I don't think it will be controversial to say that there isn't much trust in genetically modified organisms at this point. And I think there are very good reasons for caution when it comes to introducing novel insects and animals into our already fragile ecosystems. An unprecedented control over nature and our animals may change our relationship to the earth and to the environment in, in unexpected ways that require some that require deliberation. But as we've seen, they also do a lot of good. Having these insects and animals around will, will do a lot of good for both the animals themselves, ecosystems at large, and for human beings. Um, but I think educating people and having a frank and honest discussion about the pros and cons of introducing these into our environments and what systems are in place to minimize the risks uh, will ultimately improve trust going forward. So thank you, uh, a couple of references, and I'll look forward to your questions.